The leather couch had been slashed open with many cuts and the padding pulled out, and the glass doors of the kitchen cabinets had been smashed. More than half the liquor bottles in the liquor cabinet were missing, and the medicine in the bathroom cabinet was gone. It all seemed very familiar. I mean, even my 13-year-old dog's arthritis pills were taken. My dog Drake has an anxiety problem, so we keep him in a crate whenever we leave the house. Thinking of what happened to Chris's dog, I ran down the hall to the office where the crate is kept. I shined what little light I had from my phone on the crate and saw its door open, and it looked empty. I stepped forward, afraid at what I'd see, and shone the light into the crate and saw Drake cowering in the back, whimpering. That's when the cops pulled up. My family came home soon afterwards. When the cops asked us if we had any enemies, since the house mostly just seemed to be tossed, I had to tell them about Butcher Face. While the cops were looking around, they noticed that the power hadn't been cut. It turned out that every single light bulb in the whole house had been partially unscrewed, leaving the light bulb in the socket but not able to light up. This was the first time my family had heard about Butcher Face, and they asked me to stop seeing Chris. I hadn't so much as talked to Chris on the phone for almost two months after that. Very little had happened in that time, but something still didn't feel right. For one thing, my sister, who worked nights, started asking me to stand at the front door and wait until she got into her car whenever she left, since she leaves after dark. I asked a couple of times why, but she never gave an answer. It's like she just felt creeped out or that she was being watched whenever she went outside. Our dog still seemed to be spooked too. Whenever we'd tie him outside, he'd only do his business and come right back in, which is very out of character for him. One day I was standing at my back door looking into the backyard, thinking of all of this, when my eyes locked onto the shed in my backyard and I remembered the story told to us by the people we talked to whose house we saw on the tapes. They found evidence of someone living in their shed. I went to my room and picked up a sword from my nerdy sword collection and went out to the shed. I crossed the yard and when I got to the shed I found it unlocked. I opened the door and looked inside, only using the sunlight since there's no power running to it. I immediately saw a pile of trash in the far corner. It was a loose pile of tarps, cloth from umbrellas, and trash bags that had a compression in the middle like someone had been lying in it. Off to the side of the pile was the missing liquor bottles from inside the house and some garbage. This guy had been living in the shed and there was a good chance he had been there since the house was broken into two months ago. In fact, for all I know, he could have been in there that night when I went to the shed for the pitchfork, watching me. I didn't want to freak out my family, so I cleaned it up in secret. At the bottom of the bedding of trash, I found a ratty notebook. I only half opened it to a random page, saw some very familiar artwork and immediately closed it, tore it up and threw it in the trash. A couple weeks later, I got a phone call from Chris. He said he was still doing some looking around and found some strange stuff. Before I could say that I didn't want to hear it, he said he went back to the house of the women who were the former owners of the house who we had talked to before. Before I could respond to this, he said, They lied. Come see me tomorrow. The next day, without telling my family, I drove back to Chris's house. When I got there, I was greeted by his mother, who seemed to be in a good mood. I asked her how it was going, and knowing what I was talking about, she said nothing strange had happened there for a couple months. I asked where Chris was, and she pointed to the stairs that led down to his basement bedroom. I opened the door and immediately heard Chris talking, but I couldn't quite hear what he was saying, but assumed that he was talking to his girlfriend. When I got to a point on the stairs that I could see into his room, I saw that he was sitting in front of his desk, talking to a video camera. I asked him what the hell he was doing and he smiled and said nothing and turned off the camera and slid it back between his monitor and computer tower like it wasn't strange that he was talking to a camera just like Butcherface did. 
By this time, I had gotten to the bottom of the stairs and Chris stood from his chair and immediately changed the subject. He walked up to me and started talking about how, a couple of days before, he drove to the house of the old women who used to own his house. When he got there, he parked across the street and waited. He knew that the former owner of the house, Louise, had died and that her sister Shirley moved away soon after and that someone had been living in her house since then. He was hoping to see Butcher Face either entering or leaving the house. Instead, he saw Shirley pull into the driveway. They got out of their cars at the same time. Shirley apparently didn't see Chris because she just continued to the house. By the time he caught up to her, she had already gone into the house, but she then began to back out, apparently shocked at something she saw in there. When he got to her, she was already back on the porch. He started talking to her, and she finally told him what she really knew about Butcher Face. Like we already knew, she started with when her sister Louise and her husband bought the house. They wanted to replace the wiring and plumbing, but before that could happen, Louise's husband had the stroke and eventually died. This is where the story left off before. What they didn't tell us is that a couple years after her husband's death, Louise still couldn't afford paying for it, so she decided to sell it instead. After it just sitting there for not too long, they thought it would be relatively easy to fix up, so they, in their early 60s at the time, decided to do it themselves. When they arrived to check out the house for the first time, they found the house like it looks in the videos, with garbage everywhere and drawings on the wall with burnt out candles everywhere and a hole in the basement. They began to clean it up, picking up the garbage, putting up cheap wallpaper, putting down carpeting, and boarding up the hole in the basement as best they could. One thing she did mention that we never noticed is that in the basement there was another hole in the cinder block wall in the foundation that led into the backyard. They bricked up the hole, but due to their budget and old age they never used any mortar. They just laid the bricks in place and left it at that. Chris asked her if they put the videos in the hole and she outright refused to answer. We determined that if anybody knew where that hole in the wall was, they could just remove the cinder blocks and get into the hole and do whatever they wanted there, like hiding some tapes. We went out to his backyard to see if this was true and we did indeed find a patch of the cinder block wall where you could remove the blocks. They seemed to have fresh scrape marks like they had been recently moved, but we couldn't be sure. Chris resumed his story and told of how he and Shirley continued their conversation with her telling him that while cleaning out the kitchen, they found a rectangular object wrapped in tinfoil. They unwrapped it and found a videotape. They brought it back home and popped it in their VCR and watched it. Apparently there was no picture, the screen was just black like the lens cap had been left on or something but it seemed to be intentional because what the video lacked in visuals, it compensated for with sound. He said she described it as rants and strange noises for the entire tape. He said she then ended their conversation and quickly walked back to her car, left her house's door open, and drove away. Chris then abruptly changed the subject by jumping back to his desk and pulling a folder out of a drawer and opening it up. The papers inside were printouts of various disconnected websites showing pictures of stills from videotapes, drawings, photos, and carvings that all looked familiar. He said, Look, they're from all over the country, including some places in Mexico and Canada. Some of these apparently even appear in some places in Europe. It's like he's traveling around and leaving the stuff wherever he can. Chris then said that he will continue his investigation into Butcher Face. That investigation continued for four years, until last weekend. I hate to make this sound cliched, but Chris became pretty obsessed with trying to find out who Butcher Face was. His investigation was slow, finding the occasional picture or video. He even traveled to a town near Denver, Colorado, because he believed he found what he called a nest, a place where Butcher Face seemed to appear often, much like around our area but he didn't find much. We were never really sure what was fueling Chris's interest in Butcher Face because he had no more of Butcher Face's media since his father burned.